Hello, and welcome to video number five, in which we're going to be looking at species. We'll think about what these are, how we define them, and the problems with a couple of the ways that we do. So let's go. When we are thinking about organisms above the level of the individual or the population, the idea of a species is a key concept. So a species is the fundamental unit we tend to use in taxonomy. We'll define what that is in our phylogeny lecture, but this is it's the way that we organize living organisms. Levels above species, say genus through family order, tend to be a bit more subjective in the amount of change that they encompass. In many areas of the study of evolution, the idea of species takes a kind of the role of a fundamental biological unit. We often think about change, for example, at, as taking place at the species level. Given the importance of this concept, it must be easy to define, right? Nah, mate. Nah, it's really difficult. Um, so I have tried to put a definition on this slide, and I found the broadest definition that I could. And this, this definition from a dictionary suggests um, that a species is a group of organisms that resemble each other more than they resemble other members of other groups. And a species can also not be subdivided into two or more species. So following that example, each of these bats would be a species if individual members of the group um, that looking at these bats resemble each other more than they do others. But also note that that's a recursive definition, right? So it's a definition for the word species that includes the word species in it. That's gen generally fairly bad in when we're defining words or concepts. And that reflects the fact that actually it's really difficult to pin down what a species is. And so the definition has to remain very, very vague. This definition um, actually alludes to, in the second part, the fact that there are different concepts by which we identify species. So it says the precise definition of what constitutes a species differs depending on which species concept is applied. So over the course of this video, we're going to meet a couple of these species concepts um, with an emphasis of thinking about morphology and the fossil record and anatomy. But it's worth, I think, stopping before we do so to think about why this is challenging. And this is challenging because essentially what a species is, is us looking out at the, the full diversity of the world as it is outside our window right now. And in a timestamp, a single timestamp, trying to identify groups of organisms to help us understand the diversity of life. That timestamp is fundamentally a bit different to what we were thinking of at the end of the last video, which is lineages changing through time. Each species probably maps to a lineage through time, but sometimes these lineages split, right? And if your timestamp is at the point that those two lineages are splitting, then we're going to have something of a problem about how we define that species. And I, th I think that's the root cause of some of our problems. So let's move on and think how we might define a species. So I've put on this slide the, a definition for the biological species concept. This is the most commonly used definition of a species as a group of natural populations that interbreed between themselves, but not with other such groups from which they are reproductively isolated. That's a very famous species concept. You've probably met it before. Um, when we identify a species, we normally give it a binomial name. That's the, the, the kind of the basis of the Linnaean system. Um, which we'll learn about if you've not come across it before, but you probably have in the phylogeny lecture. And we might use the tiger as an example of this. So the tiger is Panthera tigris. That's its um, binomial. And if we look at this slide, you can see that there are a large number of, of slightly different tigers. There's the Malayan tiger, the Bengal tiger, the Amal tiger, Indo-Chinese and Sumatran tiger. There's variety within the species in terms of its morphology, and especially notably from this image, its coat colour. But this has been normally designated as a single species with a series of different subspecies. Why is that? Why are these not different species? To answer this question, we need to look at the distribution of these organisms in space. So these um, these kind of slightly colourful varieties of subspecies all represent separate popul populations in different areas that do not today breed with each other. Their current range is 
too small to let them overlap with each other and for them to, to breed together. And indeed, this is reflected in their DNA. On the right hand side here, you can see an evolutionary tree of these subspecies um, showing how they're related with the color coding that is matched to the ranges that are shown on the map on the left hand side here. But as I, as I said earlier, this is just a snapshot of tigers today. In the relatively recent past, uh, before mankind's influence occurred and um, the ranges shrunk, um, this, this group had a far larger range and these subspecies could interbreed. Given we know that these subspecies can breed with each other, and when they do so, they have viable offspring, and they did so within kind of the relatively recent geological past, the scientific community has developed a consensus that these are members of the same species. So even though they appear different and they don't interbreed um, in the wild today, that's very recently come about, and therefore we consider them the same species. Let's bear that in mind, but then let's compare that to another member of the same genus, the lion, Pantera leo. And if you're wondering that, uh, if this is where Pantera, the metal band, got their name from, it is. On the left, we can see the tiger range map that I showed you before, but without the color coding. And on, in the middle here, you can see the historic range of the lion. So ob obviously its present day distribution, again, has been heavily impacted by humans. But before human activity came along, and um, climatic changes that occurred um, as a result of the changes um, due to ice ages, uh, the ranges of tigers and lions overlapped. They clearly in deep time have had the opportunity to interbreed. And indeed, if we put um, tigers and lions in the same enclosure in captivity, they do interbreed. You can see some um, two examples of um, a, a, a liger on the right hand side here. But these hybrids, these juveniles, are sterile. So even though these two ranges previously could interbreed, they obviously did not do so because we've had enough of reproductive isolation forming that they um, provide, they, they produce when they do interbreed a sterile hybrid. As such, the biological species concept differentiates the lion and the tiger as different species. All species concepts I should highlight at this point are helpful in helping us understand evolution, but also all of them have their own issues. If there was a perfect species definition, I would just be teaching you that and life would probably be a lot simpler. As an example of the weakness of this um, species definition, um, biological species cannot be um, used to define species in organisms that, for example, reproduce asexually. In bacteria, shown on the top left here, for example, um, what a uh, species is in a bacteria is very different in its definition to what a species is in a eukaryote. And it's not always a useful concept in it for bacteria, depending on what you're doing with them. In bacteria, ecotypes, these are structures uh, that, have, that exist, that have the quintessential properties of species as recognized by many systematists outside of microbiology. So there's a different structure in microbiology that's a bit like a species that's not defined on the ability to interbreed because these things are asexual. And it's not just single-celled organisms that we have a problem with. Aphids, such as this beautiful creature on the bottom left, are often asexual in their mode of life. And there's a whole world of borderline cases out there that again may make us question the veracity of the biological species concept. In the middle here you can see the carrion crow and the hooded crow. These are two different crow species, but they hybridize easily and have viable offspring to the extent where the, their ranges are marked um, in light and dark gray on this map of Europe. And in this thick black line here, you can see a hybrid zone where many of the crows are actually a hybrid between the two. So under the biological species concept, we could write, uh, quite rightly ask, do these deserve to be two separate species? In some groups, the ability to hybridize can really make us doubt the wisdom of using reproductive isolation to delineate species at all. A really cool recent example was this paper by Caldi et al. These authors show unequivocally that a sturgeon, shown on the left here, 
can hybridize with a paddlefish. And you may be sitting there being like, well, big whoop, why should I care? Well, these represent two really very different lineages. They share a common ancestor about 155 million years ago. So these two are separated by 155 million years of evolution, but they can hybridize to create these funky looking fishes on the right hand side here. We are yet to find out whether those hybrids are sterile because um, they take a while to get to maturity. So I guess we'll find out sometime in the next five or so years. But nevertheless, this may shake our faith in the, in the biological species concept to its very core. I think there's an element of truth to the idea that actually um, exceptions are often really quite informative. And the same is true in terms of the biological species concept. There are a few really informative exceptions that we use to study the process of speciation by which species form, which we're going to look at in the next video, um, where, where these exceptions are really informative about that process. And one of these is called a ring species. Um, the example that I show on this slide is a really famous one that focuses on a species of salamanders with a series of subspecies shown in different colours. These are overlaid in terms of their um, their um, distribution on a map of California here. And a ring species is really interesting because it represents a continuum of genetic change in a species of an organism, in this case salamanders, across a large range, in this case California. There is not enough gene flow across the whole range to allow full mixing of both end members. And so the members of either end of the range may become reproductively isolated, despite the fact that there's constant gene flow um, between any two um, areas of that range that are directly next to each other. This example shows that actually you've got this continuum of genetic change along this large range, but when they, they meet, uh, around other sides of a valley, we actually have um, uh, reproductive isolation having formed, um, despite this breeding across the entire range. And this um, paper that I've linked here shows that when the two ends of this range meet, uh, very infrequently is there hybridization. And that only occurs in some limited circumstances, shown, uh, a hybrid is shown here on the right hand side. So this idea of a ring species is basically just um, it is an example of speciation happening in the biological species concept. Under the, spe the uh, biological species concept, um, speciation happening in real time, as it were. It's very, very cool. And of course, we have, when it comes to the biological species concept, paleontological, very specific problems here. If we look at the fossil record, we may question looking at, for example, humans and hominids. Um, this is one of our best sample fossil records. We've got a really clear picture of the, human, the, the evolution of things that are closely related to us because we're very interested in that topic. But when we're looking at that fossil record, we then have to ask, when does an interbreeding population become separate from, um, from another one? And when, where to draw the line between species? Um, we may look at the morphological differences between, say, humans, shown here, and Neanderthals, shown here, um, and assume they were different enough, based on their morphology, that they did not interbreed. However, in recent years, there's been a deluge of work on ancient DNA from subfossils, where we can actually map the DNA of Neanderthals and other hominid species, such as the Denisovans, we'll cover this in our lecture on terrestrial evolution, that show that there was interbreeding between the Neanderthals and modern humans. So this actually forces us to, to think about our spe species definitions very carefully and, and accept that they are quite fuzzy. Um, we can identify different species morphologically in the fossil record, but they actually may still um, be organisms that were interbreeding. Um, up to 6% of uh, modern humans' DNA comes from a Neanderthal, so there you go. So that raises the question. I've, I've highlighted that paleontologists will struggle with the biological species definition. Um, that leaves us with the question, what can paleontologists do? Well, as a result, paleontologists often use an alternative definition. This is the morphological or phonetic species concept. This is the definition of species as groups of individuals that look similar to each other 
and distinct from other groups. A kind of a related kind of um, idea is the phylogenetic concept, which is the smallest aggregation of sexual populations or asexual lineages that are diagnosable by a unique combination of character states. One of those places this very much in a tree-like framework, the other doesn't. But both of them are defined by looking at the morphology of organisms and using that to define a slide. For paleontologists, that has specific example advantages over the biological species concept because it allows us to look at species in the fossil record based on their morphology alone. So we can use this, if we want, to um, define living species. We could say that tigers are large carnivorous cats, usually with a tawny coat, tr transversely striped with black. Meanwhile, lions, shown on the right here, are large heavily built social cats with a tawny body, tufted tail, and a shaggy blackish or brown mane in the male. We can also use that to define living genera, say, we could say Panthera, the genus to which both these exist, uh, belong, um, are big cats characterised by a partially ossified hyoid bone and roaring behaviour. And then we can do that all of the way up. We can define mammals based on their shared characteristics, etc, etc, etc. So that works. But this comes into its own, and indeed is the, only, the really the only way we can differentiate species when we're looking at the fossil record. Because of this, we've ha developed over the years a formalised way by which species work in the fossil record. If we return to our human evolution example, the fossil on the left hand side here is a very famous individual that's called Lucy, a member of a species of um, the genus Australopithecus. So actually, if you're interested, Australopithecus afarensis. We define this species as a hominid, and hominid will have its own definition with the features that are listed on the right hand side here. I'm not going to read them all out for you, but you can see there are a series of um, characters based on the bones of this individual which define it as a member of that species. And indeed there will be one particular specimen, one particular fossil, held in a museum that is used as a benchmark for that species. In that case its description, its diagnosis, is the, uh, the word that it's, it's generally used for this, is the basis of um, that species definition. It defines this particular species and that is called the type fossil. So a diagnosis, this is the definition of a morphological species, should specifically identify all the features that sets that species apart from others in terms of morphology. That's often found in papers in a section called the systematic paleontology and that allows us to define a species based on its anatomy. Brilliant, right? And of course, in order to make this tractable, we have to think of edge cases. What happens if there isn't a single fossil that we can use as the type of species? What do we do in that case? And I can assure you, there are rules and conventions that high, that kind of allow us to, to control this, um, this kind of behavior that define a species in the fossil record. But there are problems with this too. Those problems include variation within a species, sometimes called polymorphism. You can see on the left hand side here, these are all members of the same species um, of a Hawaiian happy face spider, but they look very, very different. And that's something that we may expect to see in the fossil record. We know things such as um, ecophenotypes exist. This is when a single species will have a different morphology based upon the environment upon in which it's living. This is an example of how a species adapts to its environment. And you can see members of the same species that have very different morphological forms in these gastropods in the middle here. We also have problems in terms of cryptic species. This is when species appear morphologically identical. You can't tell them apart from morphology, but are actually different. And we could identify them in living groups under the biological species concept. That may be because they're very closely related and haven't diverged enough in terms of morphology yet, or due to mimicry, such as is shown in the butterflies on the right-hand side here. In the fossil record, each one of these pairs here, we would probably consider the same species because they don't look different enough to diagnose them as different species. And whilst the morphological species concept is a useful concept for paleontologists, it's all we have, as I've mentioned, there are specific difficulties in paleontology when applying this concept. 
An obvious one is the fact that we have systematic biases um, that come from the fossil preservation processes. Process, sorry. So Lucy's skull is shown on the left-hand side here from a 3D model that I will embed in the website below this video. And as you can see, this is um, actually relatively patchily preserved. All of these light patches here are the only bones that are bits of her skull that are left. All of the rest of this stuff, this darker brown stuff, is actually inferred from other fossils or from close relatives. So there is a bias in place there. Um, fossils as a whole are often incomplete. Lucy as well, shown in the middle here, has lost her soft tissues. These preserve less well than bones, and this is an example of a systematic um, bias. Indeed, if we put both these things together, you can see that not only are we missing um, the soft tissues for Lucy, we're missing many of her bones as well. She's a, a highly incomplete fossil. So even in one of the best sample fossil records that we have in humans, the fossil record, as shown on the right hand side, is patchy here. Our sampling is incomplete. There are a series of time periods where we don't have the right rocks, um, or we don't have rocks in the right places to actually preserve fossils. And so we have this patchy picture of how these lineages are evolving. And the more you think about it, the more you will see areas where applying this concept in the fossil record is difficult. So for example, in a sexually dimorphic species, when your boys don't look like your girls, how do you tell those are members of the same species in the fossil record as opposed to um, being members of different species. Nevertheless, this is the best we have to identify species in the fossil record. And those are just two of the possible um, ways that we can define species, or two of the concepts we can use to define species. I've put a couple more, or three more in fact, the calistic species concept ecological species concept and recognition species concept on the bottom here, should you wish to research them further? I think it's actually a really, really interesting question. And we're going to finish in our last video by looking at how species form. So I will see you there very shortly.